This is Duke University. Uh, and uh, now, it's now my uh, pleasure to present uh, Dr. Harvey Feinberg, um, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, for his for a talk and however he'd like to take the discussion. And you're encouraged to ask questions um, as he goes forward. Uh, uh, and or not, as the case may be, there will be a time for questions afterwards. So Harvey, thank you so much for coming. It's a great, great pleasure to have you here. Well, Joel, thank you very much. Thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, even if it is an assignment, I hope that it will be worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> for me, uh, coming to Duke and uh, being with Joel Fleischman to talk about philanthropy, uh, it seems honestly like I didn't even yet qualify for the first class <laughs> in philanthropy. Uh, Joel literally not only wrote the book, I think it's at least three books that I it's, have on yeah. the subject, uh, and has uh, so masterfully uh, carried forward philanthropy from every side uh, that it's just an honor to be here with you, Joel, well, and with uh, everyone who's here. The honor is ours. Well, so uh, it's true I'm the president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and I've been there for about three years now. Uh, and I had uh, served on a board of uh, a foundation, the Hewlett uh, Foundation, which I'm just concluding my service, and I had served on the board of a smaller medically oriented foundation called the Macy Foundation oh, really? in, uh, in New York. But most of my life I spent on the requesting side of the desk, uh, trying to extract resources from the uh, from the donors or prospective funders. So most of the perspective that I bring to the task is really from the point of view of one who is uh, seeking to do good with the resources that philanthropy can provide. And that's the attitude I tried to bring also from the vantage point that I now uh, have the privilege to serve as the president at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I thought today in opening this conversation that I would uh, try to say a few words about the foundation, uh, how it originated, how it operates, what it tries to focus on, what its aim is, how it works to accomplish its goals. But mostly I hope we'll have a genuine conversation because I do want to be able to respond to the questions or topics that you are most interested in and would like most uh, to hear about. Uh, if you know how one foundation works, you know how one foundation works. <laughs> one of the extraordinary things about this field uh, is the diversity of approaches, organizational forms that different individuals and families have discovered or created to express their philanthropic impulse. Uh, so I think the idea of uh, hearing about a whole series of them in a way such as you are doing and have been doing uh, is really a wonderful way to get a fix on the scope, variety, and approaches that different places take. Uh, a word about the Moors. Gordon Moore was a founder of the Intel Corporation. I'm sure you've all heard of Intel. Uh, that's where his fortune derives. Uh, about 16 years ago, uh, he and his wife Betty decided that they wanted to put a substantial fraction of their uh, wealth into a uh, foundation that would bear their name and carry out programs of interest to them. And that was the start of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. In organizational form, it is a private foundation under uh, US law. It is structured in a way to include both family and non-family members in its governance. The majority of its board are not family. The board includes Mr. Moore as our chair and his two sons and their wives as members, but the 12-member board has a majority of non-members. And that was by design and choice 
of the, of the founders from the outset. The resources of the foundation currently amount to about six and a half billion dollars, which uh, would put it in the top couple of dozen, at least, of philanthropic organizations uh, in the U.S. One of the hallmarks of the Moore Foundation is its ability to stay with the topics that it has chosen to focus on. It is a foundation that is oriented toward making a difference in the long term by selecting important topics that others are not adequately supporting and figuring out strategically how dollars and other resources that we can apply could actually move toward the goals that the foundation has adopted. So the areas that it chose grow out of the interests and uh, passions of our founders. Uh, the first area is the environment and the conservation of the environment. Uh, this really is something that both Mr. and Mrs. Moore care deeply about. Its origin probably is the fact that they are uh, uh, very interested in, uh, in travel. Mr. Moore is a lifelong fisherman and they would go to many different places to fish. Uh, and they noticed that uh, places they had been to just a few years before when they would return would be transformed, degraded, natural beauty replaced by development. And that experience helped convince them that the general domain of conservation and preserving for the future generations uh, the beautiful and ecologically significant places that uh, were important to the world was one of the things they wanted their foundation to do. A second area uh, for the Moore Foundation is basic science. Uh, Mr. Moore himself is trained as a chemist. He believes deeply in science as a method as well as an objective. Uh, he uh, has emphasized the importance of work on basic science as distinct from what we would often think of as applied or even translational science as something that he wants the foundation to focus on. Uh, those two represent a major part of our program, but we have smaller areas of endeavor in first patient care and secondly a program devoted to the Bay Area, improving and preserving the special features of the Bay Area. I don't know how many of you ever visited the California Bay Area, but it is an unusual and rather exceptional place in many ways. Um, the patient care program really derives from Mrs. Moore's experience as a patient. Uh, I know this will surprise any of you who are medically involved, but she was actually given the wrong medicine when she was a, ho a patient in the hospital. For those of you who are not familiar with medical care, errors in medicine is a very common occurrence, and particularly errors in medication still remain the most frequent source of error. Specifically, she was administered a dose of insulin intended for another patient in the same room. And insulin is vital if you're a diabetic and need it, and it's potentially deadly if you are not a diabetic and do not need it. So this was a rather important error. Fortunately, uh, both she and the other patient uh, survived. But instead of thinking, well, how do we sue this hospital? The Moors instead figured, how do we fix this problem? And so they started uh, in the patient care program with the first area and most important in that of emphasis on improving nursing care and the ability of nurses to make uh, full use of their training uh, and professional skills. Uh, so that became uh, a hallmark of the 
first part of the patient care program. The final area on the Bay Area is really uh, focused on two aspects of the Bay Area. One is local conservation, so it's an expression of environmental conservation applied uh, to the Bay Area. And the second is uh, what you might call informal science education, which is mainly expressed through the support of local museums of science and related activity uh, in the Bay Area. I, I could go on to tell you uh, something about the specific areas of focus within each of these four uh, domains. I mentioned uh, nursing. Uh, the biggest single program in the environmental area is actually a conservation and preservation of the Amazon rainforest in what we call the Andes Amazon program. The Moore Foundation over the last 15 years has invested about $400 million into conservation in the Amazon. It has uh, probably represented the largest private investor uh, in, that, uh, in that area. There is a, a, what's called the Amazon Fund supported by the Norwegian Sovereign Fund, which is a public uh, fund from Norway and the World Bank also have contributed, but amongst uh, private philanthropy, I think the Moore Foundation stands out uh, in that area. Uh, in the science uh, program area, there are a number that I could talk about, but one that's rather uh, fascinating is an, uh, a program on emergent properties in quantum systems. This is an investment in basic physics and understanding essentially the behavior of electrons in uh, what we would call unusual environments, uh, very cold, uh, different ways of uh, understanding what happens when given the, the chance to do things like superconductivity uh, in, uh, in quantum systems. If you asked, okay, what problem is that solving the answer is we don't know yet what problem <laughs> it will solve. Just as when I was an undergraduate student and learned in science about nuclear magnetic resonance, as we called it, of atoms, at that time, uh, no one explained that this was going to become the basis of the most important imaging advance in medicine within the space of a generation. So we can't really know in the basic science to the same extent that we want to specify uh, in the more socially oriented programs like environment uh, and patient care exactly what uh, the consequence will be of the work and investment that we make. Hmm. So the main point that I would want to leave you with about the Moore Foundation's program isn't that it picked these four areas rather than child development or education or world peace or economic development or any of the other myriad worthy and important goals of philanthropy. It's that it made choices. It picked a small number of things. It chose to focus on those things. And it chooses to focus in the main through what Mr. Moore describes as a scientific method. That means thinking critically about why you're doing what you're doing, how you approach it, how you will know whether you've made any difference, and looking at data and analyses to help you decide what to do and how well you're doing. It's sometimes joked about Mr. Moore that if he were on his way to heaven, he would want to stop off in hell to get a comparison group. <laughs> and that is indicative of the attitude that has pervaded the foundation about wanting to think critically and carefully about uh, what we do and why we do it. We have a very important advantage which many who advise philanthropy advocate and very seldom is it actually carried out which is that our founders have written down their intent in setting up the foundation. And this statement, which we call the Statement of Founders' Intent, 
is available on our website and is a very important guide to the board and the staff, not only now, while the founders are still here and we can talk to them, but it will be very useful for the long term when they're no longer in place. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Moore still chairs our board, and so we are what I call a first-generation foundation, where the founder is still actively involved. Others are in a second generation. I mentioned the Hewlett Foundation. It was uh, in the time that I served on the board in what I describe as second generation, where either literally the children or those who were uh, directly friends and colleagues of the founder are still involved in the management and judgments about the foundation. But when you get beyond a second generation and go to a third generation in which those responsible no longer have the benefit of direct connection uh, or the presence of the founders, some indication of why the founders did what they did and what they hoped would be accomplished is an exceptionally valuable resource. So this is a resource that becomes even more valuable with time. And it's especially useful if it's framed in a way that recognizes what the founders want to be constant and what the founders recognize in the fullness of time will change. So for example, in the case of the Moors, their statement of founders' intent recognizes that these areas of substantive focus uh, may well evolve over time, in fact, are likely to evolve. Because even if you have made the best choices that you possibly could in today's environment, as conditions change and new situations arise, new areas of work may well take prominence. That will certainly be true within the broad domains of environment, for example, and science, but they also recognize and acknowledge that it could take them outside of those domains, take the foundation outside of those domains. They do emphasize they want the foundation to use a scientific way of thinking about what it does, regardless of what it does. They talk about four filters, which are very familiar to everyone at the Moore Foundation, that we try to apply when we're thinking about a grant, or a larger portfolio, or a major uh, investment that we call an initiative. And those four filters are essentially the questions of first, is this goal really important? Will it make a real difference that can last and be significant in the future? Secondly, can we, through our investment, make a difference in the achievement of that, of that goal? What are others doing? Why do we believe that what we might do would actually make the positive difference? Third, is it measurable? Will you know whether you are making a difference, whether you're making progress or not? And part of measurability uh, is being prepared to learn as you go and adapt as you proceed, not simply to be able to look back at what you've done, but also to look ahead at the choices that you still face. And finally, we ask if there's uh, what we call a portfolio effect, meaning how does this choice relate to the other things that you are, are trying to do? The founder's intent is also very uh, I would say significant in that it describes some things that the founders say they do not want the foundation to do. So both what they do want us to do and what they do not are important. So for example, the founders say they do not choose to invest in biomedical research as part of the science program. Now, I know the Moors in their personal philanthropy do invest in biomedical work. So why did they say that for the foundation? It wasn't a lack of interest or uh, a decision and judgment that this is less important. It's mainly 
that Mr. and Mrs. Moore want to do things they believe others will be less likely to want to do. And they believe that biomedicine has a lot of appeal to a lot of people because of personal and family involvement and that many fewer people with means will be willing to invest in the basic science that they also value and would like to see advanced. And so they, they made that choice. They also said, for example, they don't especially want the foundation to respond to emergencies. They know that those are, again, emotionally compelling, even very important, uh, urgent and necessary. At the same time, they want their foundation to maintain a focus on making a real and lasting difference in the long term. So they've indicated some things that they would say are not as important to them, some things that are. What they mainly emphasize as the hope of constancy is the commitment to making enduring change for the better and the method of approaching thinking about how to do it by applying these four filters and a scientific method and the best judgment that a board and the best execution that a staff can muster at any time in the future. So I put a lot of emphasis on the statement of founders' intent uh, because I do think it is a little bit unusual in general in the philanthropy world to have uh, such a clear statement and it's especially unusual to have one that is as uh, appreciative of its value over time and recognizes what will need to change and also what the founders hope uh, will remain constant. Does it, th your, your, dec your decision to focus on fresh water, yeah. was that uh, in any way f focused in part in, uh, in the water problem in California or was it focused on water elsewhere? Uh, is there a relationship between the two? What yeah. prompted it? And, yeah. uh, it actually grew out of a discussion of a variety of topics at a board retreat a year earlier. Uh, now, how much was that informed or conditioned on the situation in California? I'm sure it was on people's minds, so right. it, it was a, a part of it. But it is not specifically about the California situation, right. although it could evolve to that. Right. Uh, Thank you for the, for the question about how, we're, uh, how are we evolving, how are we responding to certain uh, trends like uh, collaboration and other strategies of investment. Uh, I would say from the vantage point of the Moore Foundation, the first and really important feature is we really have never cared about publicity. Uh, I would say it, it's among the less well-known foundations for its size than any That's that true. I knew about and knew not about uh, before I came to it. And that's, again, a reflection of the values and uh, preferences of the founders who have never cared for publicity. They don't really uh, want uh, everything to be about uh, the foundation, much less about them. They want it to be about the, uh, the Substance. problem solving and the yeah. people who are doing that. So we have a, a director of communications whose job is a strange one, not to publicize the foundation, <laughs> but to make sure the work is known and gets, uh, and gets accomplished. Uh, so uh, that's, that's number one. Uh, we, are, we try to position ourselves to be attentive, mindful, and learning about new trends and ideas. Uh, we are uh, perfectly prepared to embark on collaborative and joint partnership and activities uh, with our sister philanthropies and even with government agencies. So for example, we invested in a scientific work on early earthquake warning uh, in collaboration with the federal government through the geologic survey, uh, and uh, that was fine. We, uh, we have uh, a, a, a partnerships with sister foundations in areas like the Science Philanthropy Alliance, which is uh, set up to promote 
uh, better and more philanthropy devoted to science of all kinds. Uh, so that's a collaboration. Uh, we have uh, partnered with others on particular projects, uh, both as the uh, uh, both as the initiator and as the joiner. Uh, I've always felt there should be prizes for those who are the most rapid joiners, because that's the hardest thing for people to do, rather than to claim credit for having initiated. <laughs> uh, so we have a wonderful uh, recent collaboration in the Amazon with the. Uh, Amazon Fund, uh, who are helping uh, us, joining with us in support of protection of areas that are multiplying many times the resources we could bring to bear, uh, which is wonderful. We've joined with others on a project, an example in the health space is a, a, a project called Open Notes, which was really uh, uh, a program supported initially by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's the idea that everybody should have access to their uh, patient records. Uh, and it's uh, now amplifying around the country. And we, along with others, joined uh, to help in the dissemination phase uh, because we believe that's important. So uh, we view the ideas of partnership and collaboration instrumentally, not as a goal or an end in itself, but rather uh, wherever it makes sense, uh, we, like, uh, we like to join in. Uh, so I would say that's the general attitude that, that we've taken. We want to be uh, apprised and sensitive to the field and what's happening and what others are doing. Uh, and we want to uh, look at any opportunities that we have that would uh, enhance our ability to use our money wisely. So that that's the attitude we bring to it. What's you know what started sounded out, what started out sounding uh, like it was very narrow, mm. ends up looking like something that is not narrow at all. Uh, just and just I mean, going back over the things that you've just been mentioning, where you you've done things that really weren't part of the original idea, but were related. Uh, uh, in a, a, in a, discipline, a disciplinary way to the idea, but you think about all the, you know, the, 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 the specific ideas that, that you just mentioned, uh, it, it strikes me that you're, you're doing a lot of things that um, expand the reach, but may not, have been, may not have been regarded as part of the original mission of the foundation. I think the, the way I would describe it, Joel, yeah. is that I think the foundation has had a genuine fidelity to its domains of interest, right. but great creativity and adaptiveness on the means that it will uh, choose to pursue those goals. Right. So uh, uh, we've, we've been prepared to do all kinds of uh, partnership or investment as it makes sense. Uh, but I would say it's, it's largely been in these domains of environmental conservation, science, patient care, and the Bay Area. Right. Uh, not really much outside of that. Right. It's absolutely fascinating. Yep. Uh, does the political climate affect our philanthropy in any, in any way? Jennifer. Well, it depends what the tax law uh, <laughs> sure. that comes out. That will affect uh, our philanthropy <laughs> and affect just about everyone else. Uh, for example, there's a provision in the tax proposal uh, in, uh, I believe, the Senate, but not the House version, that would have a uniform excise tax rate uh, for private foundations. That would change uh, our situation. Uh, so uh, we will be affected by political decisions. But if you're talking about the overall political climate, uh, really, uh, from our vantage point, it may influence where we see opportunity within our domains, but uh, I would say it's not as strong a, uh, an effector as, uh, as you might think. A profound answer. <laughs> Seriously. Um, Thank you. This has really been fascinating to me. The, I, 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 the, as you've described the workings of the foundation, it became more and more obvious how brilliant the basic um, plan is, basic. and that's fascinating. And it's something 
uh, it teaches me something about, I don't know another foundation that operates like this, but frankly, they're, they're much looser, actually. Um, and you all are much tighter in the sense that, that you've, got a, you've got ideas and you find things that are related to those ideas, you want to do them. So I can't thank you enough for coming and speaking. So, and thank you all for you know, spending this afternoon listening. I, I, I was personally satisfied, of, of, of very excited about it. Uh, and and I've, I've heard a lot of talks about philanthropy, and this is among the most exciting ones that I've heard. So I thank you for that. Well, thank and you, Joe. <laughs> thank you all.